without any more chatter. So everything David said is absolutely true. Um, but the part that you need to remember the most is that I'm Josh's dad. <laughs> Josh's dad. <laughs> really happy to be here. And I think I have some explaining to do uh, because I've chosen a title for this talk that is a, a bit mysterious. If any of you have attempted to Google what a neutron graph is in an attempt to get a head start on tonight's talk, you presumably didn't find much because I, I've just made these up um, in the last couple of, of well, really in the, in the past month. And so you're among the very first to, to meet these creatures. Uh, and to, I guess, to help motivate why we, we refer to these graphs as neutron graphs, we're going we're to get there by way of physics. So we're going to start with a little old chestnut which I'm not going to ask you to vote. Just think in your head. <laughs> is it the feathers? Is it the lead? And if you said this, then give yourself a pat on the back. <laughs> because, in fact, <clears throat> a pound is a pound. And, of course, it's not, the, it's, it's not the, the weight that you maybe were thinking of that makes this funny. It's, it's, it's something, the, the thing that makes the difference between feathers and lead is their density. It's how much mass is packed into this, to a certain amount of space that makes the difference between, between that ingot and that, and that, well, it would take a pretty large pillow to, to match it. <laughs> so density is what we're, really, um, what we're really getting at here. And, and a neutron star is features the, some of the most dense material in the, in sort of in, in the known universe. And just to illustrate, so this is not a 10 kilometer cube, that's a much smaller cube, but if you can sort of try to imagine blowing that up to a 10 kilometer, six mile by six mile by six mile cube, that's a lot of mass. Now, start to compress that and get it down to the density that you see inside a neutron star and you fill up about that much space. <laughs> so neutron stars are like, we're talking, there's. Yeah, we're talking some real heavy stuff. <laughs> a neutron graph, so keep that idea in mind as we, as we start to explore what a neutron graph is. We're going to wed that idea, that, that um, sense of density, with polynomials, which you've probably met, but let's have a quick refresher. So a polynomial is uh, you, you take powers of x and, and, you, and, you, and you string them all together to create something that looks like that. So we've got a fifth power and a square and we'll subtract off an, an x. And just, just to practice, uh, can you imagine plugging 2 into that expression? Uh, if you plug in x equals 2, in fact, this time I will take a, a volunteer. Can, you, can anyone tell us what, what the output is? Yeah? 38. So you take 2 to the fifth, which is 32. The 32. Good. Yeah. And then we add. 2 times 2, another 4. That brings us to 36. And then you added another 2. So, what was that name? <laughs> Maddie. Maddie. Maddie um, added all three of those to get 38. And then if you subtract it, of course, it drops down to 34. So that's, that's what we're doing. We're, we're, a, a fifth power just means multiplying something by itself five times. And you can plug in different values of x, and I'll come different values. Uh, this one's a little more tame. I get three, I, I toss three x squareds into the mix, four of my x's, and then Technically, a, a 1 is a power of x as well. It's x to the 0. So here are polynomials. And one good way of, of keeping track of all of these inputs versus outputs is to draw a picture of them. So I'm going to do that right here. Here's 3x squared plus 4x plus 1. What, what you're seeing is, for each of the points in the graph, what we're doing is we're, we're plugging in. Oh, I'm, uh, I'm plugging in 0 to my formula, and out comes 1. And that's why there's a little dot here. If I plug in negative 1 to the formula, then I get negative 1 squared comes out to be positive 1. So I get 3 minus 4 plus 1. 3 and the 1 and the 4 exactly balances the negative 4. And that's why there's a 0. A 0 is a place where the graph crosses the axis. And, and polynomials that just involve x squareds and x's tend to have this shape. These are parabolas. And you can make them go upside down, and some of them are real fat and some of them are tall and skinny. It all depends on what numbers you use in front of your x squared and your x and, and your constant. But they all have that general shape. Uh, now it's your turn. So we're going to build a polynomial. Let's, let's see how these things look. I'm going to add another, um, another a 
Actually, I'll just get rid of this one. Let's just start a new one. Uh, so we're going to get some numbers from the audience. We're going to we're going to pick one, let's say one digit numbers, and just so that you you know that your turn is coming and there are no surprises. I'm going to start right here, and you're going to pick a one digit number. And we're going to we're going to make a fifth power um, a quintic polynomial. So we're going to go with 7x to the 5th, and then we'll subtract off 5x five. Five to the 4th, and then we'll add on 8. 8x cubed, 3x uh, three. Three squared, k, 4 4x, and then finally 9. 9 plus 9. Let's see what we got here. So <laughs> we might have to zoom out a little bit. Yep. Uh, let's see what... Oh, yeah, I might have to zoom out a lot. So, in fact, I can, I can zoom out. I'm going to go from sort of negative 1,000 <laughs> to 1,000 here. Let's see what we've got. Um, you know, we're not getting too many wiggles. A fifth power can get a lot of wiggling in there. Our choice of numbers has, has led to a, a less <laughs> than. We were looking pretty good around. Um, uh, uh, let's, see what, let's, let's see what we've got now. Uh, this is a little more interesting. So what I'm trying to get across to you is you can play with these things. You can tinker with the numbers. Uh, uh, this one crosses the x-axis. It looks like three different places, and it has one um, sort of maximal point there and a minimal point. Anybody know offhand how what's the maximum number of times that a, that a degree five polynomial can can bend and turn around? <coughs> yeah. Is it five? You can go up to well. In fact, four. Uh, Here's the three x. It is four. That's right. Three x squared plus four. Let's let's demonstrate that here. Plus one. Here's our original parabola. I'm gonna go back to the uh, back to our original settings, and you can see the degree two object has exactly one bend. It tends to be one less than the degree, and it, also our degree two thing hit the x-axis exactly twice. A degree five graph can or a degree five polynomial can hit that x-axis at most five times. The degree, the upshot is, the degree um, uh, determines the shape of the graph to some extent. Uh, and so here, uh, this is sort of clear, but this is the part where we all feel good about getting the right answer. So the degree is, give this one definitely a degree. Five. Uh, there is, and this is a degree two. two. And as we've just seen, we get the, the different shapes depending on the degree. I've got two more polynomials to show you. Uh, and, and then we'll unveil sort of the surprise. Just so that is probably going to be what the degree. Four. Good. That is a degree four. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of confidence in you, <laughs> as you can tell. And, and here's a degree five. I'm going to zip back. Uh, you're going to have to help me remember the coefficients. Minus 10, minus 60, and plus 40. So we're going to go over here and take a look at this one. Take these off. Um, we've got, let's see, minus 10. What again? Yep. Minus, minus 60. 60. Okay, minus 60. What is it, minus or plus 40? Plus 40. Plus 40. Okay. So again, you can sort of see something's going on there. Uh, but to get the full picture, and I, I try this out ahead of time, I'm going to come back here and we're going to take a much broader look, negative 3,000 to 3,000, as we're going to keep track of the outputs in that range. Uh, here we go. And, and um, so it looks... Uh, but then just, oh, so there's some more <laughs> hiding there. These things take a lot of space to see all of the behavior. That's just finally, uh, right, we finally, <laughs> way down here at negative 60,000, that's where it finally turns around and comes back. 
huge viewing window required. And those numbers aren't, I mean, those aren't huge numbers. It, you get up to degree five polynomials and, and you have to multiply something by itself five times, just like Maddie did earlier. And that, that, that multiplies up quickly. So here's the other one right here. We're looking at, a, a, I've got a degree six one. This should really worry you. <laughs> So 32x to the 6, again, you're going to have to help me with 32, 48, 18. And this time you'll notice we're jumping down from a 6th power to a 4th power to a 2nd power. So 32, I'll do the first one and you help me with the rest. Um, uh, let's see what it is. So it's 32x to the 6. 48. 48. And I remember the 4th, and then we added something. 18. 18? 18x squared uh, minus 1. And there, well, hang on. This one. There's, so there's obviously there's something going on in here. <laughs> so we may have to zoom in a little bit again to see it. Uh, in fact, uh, I'm going to, well, let's see, 5,000. There's a bunch of activity, but it's all, I'm going to go back to our, our default zoom, back to the um, <laughs> 5 by 5. There's the – so all of the action is packed into this little tiny space. This is basically negative 1 to 1 here and negative 1 to 1 there. I'm going to call that the unit window, sort of like out to 1 in every direction. This, this monstrous polynomial that we were kind of bracing ourselves turns out to pack, it's, it's like a neutron star. It packs all of the action into this little tiny space. And we could have called them genie graphs too, perhaps. Uh, but I didn't think of that. <laughs> uh, so this is how we'll define what a neutron graph is. It's, uh, it comes in right at the corners. Um, it, it, it does some wiggling, but it exactly comes up and touches, you can see here. Uh -huh. Exactly comes up to the, here's the y equals one <laughs> level. It just reaches the border of that, of that window and then turns around at the last possible second. And it does that at every single spot. Uh, and then once outside the window, it just shoots off to infinity, it takes off. It doesn't, it doesn't do anything more. So think to yourself, how does that look? A degree two, of course, is one of these parabolas. It just bit, turns in one spot and then heads out. How would a parabola fit into the unit window in such a way to be a neutron graph? I want you to see if you can picture this, this shape in your head. And then hopefully you came up with something like that. Comes in at a corner, leaves at a corner, and it, and it just touches the, the bottom side. Well, I'd like to tr I'm gonna go, we're going to go on a neutron graph Hunt. We're going to try to actually come up with some formulas for these guys. And a parabola seems like a, as friendly a spot to start as any. If we just pick precisely the right values of A, B, and C there, then we'll get one of these. Anyone have any idea? Say that again? C negative 1. Ah, good thinking, because you're thinking – when you plug in zero for x right here, we better get negative one as the output, and so we better put a negative one for c. So that's a start. We need a negative one for c. Uh, any other thoughts before we go back and tinker with those folks? Yeah? I, I think b has to be zero, because otherwise it'll shift left or right. Oh, good thing. So there are some experts here who understand how the numbers you put in front of those powers of x affect the shape of the graph. And it's, he's right. The, to, to shift it one way or the other, you would put a number here, and if we put zero there, that'll keep it centered. So it, with that in mind, let's get a, I'm going to just draw one on top. Here, we, so far we've heard that we need some kind of power of x. I'll turn that into a slide. And we subtract one and we leave off the x term. So what this is showing, the way you want to read this is, if we put a, that's an <laughs> and what you do now is you shake your fist and you say, Kersher you. <laughs> you always wonder 
everyone that you learn in like ed school, it's like these corny jokes. That's what you learn. Uh, so what this does is it uses a one in the place there, and a one doesn't seem to be quite doing the job. So you want to bump it up or down the, the a value. We're just going to play. Okay, up it goes. We're going to we're going to go up. There's a equals one, one point two. If we move over, if we adjust it just enough. Oh look, if we adjust it to, to the value of two, it looks like. It's just going to fit in the window like we want. It looks like we found our equation, 2x squared minus 1. And indeed, we have, um, because that is the next neutron graph. And if, if you combine some kind of intelligent hunt with, with some tinkering like this, you can find a few more. And I've done us all the favor of listing the first six. Uh, <laughs> well, first seven, if you count one. Which, at this point, you should be feeling that's nice, but, um, but suppose I wanted to make some, where, you know, where do these come from? How did I come up with all of these equations? And, and the good news is you too can create equations <laughs> of neutron graphs, and we're going to figure out how, and I'm going to point us in the right direction, which is that a productive way of looking at this is, is to try to build equations from previous equations. That's the idea of a recursive definition. It's like Fibonacci numbers. Once you've got two of them, you can add them and get the next. And then you've got two new ones, and you add them and you get the next, and you keep going like that. But it, there must be a little bit more going on here because we can't just add those and get the next. So I'm going to focus your attention on just, the, just this one for now. What can we do with this one to make it look more like that? And it's no first saying, subtract 4x cubed, add 8x to the fourth. I'm looking for just a, a one-step operation. Do this, and then we'll make this look a lot more like that. But I need an algebraic step. And you're thinking of multiplying by 3. Yeah. So, ah, so we want to multiply by 2. That'll turn the 4 into the 8. And I heard someone else say the x, because that'll turn the x cubed into x4. So that's exactly what we do. We multiply it by 2x. And that's pretty close. Now we've got 8x to the fourth. We've got a minus 6x squared. Uh -huh. Ah, so if we subtract that one, we get another minus 2x squared, and there would be our minus 8x squared, and the minus 1 return. It would all work out perfectly. Uh, but it might be coincidental. Like, that might work for these two and not the next two. You, you don't know until you, until you try your theory out. So... Let's go to the last two in my list. I, I had a fifth degree and a sixth degree. That was the extent of our knowledge as of now. What if we try this? What's, well, how is it going to start? 64x and a 7. Now we're going to tax your mental arithmetic skills. 96. 96x to the 5th. So that's going to be the 96x to the 5th, but then we have another minus 16x to the 5th. Minus 112, I heard it, good. If I hear it, I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> admit. Now what? Yes, there's a plus 56, and then we're home free. Minus 7x. <laughs> okay, here we go. I'll put it in right here. We can get rid of our slide. Sixty-four x to the seventh, minus one twelve x to the fifth, plus fifty-six x cubed, mm. minus seven. X. Oh, success! <laughs> <laughs> there it is. You have made a neutron graph, and uh, and that's sort of satisfying. It's like if we <laughs> if you put them all on top of each other. Here, we'll just. We'll just, so here are all the first nine of them. Um, the, yeah, I'm not sure which one is which. <laughs> but but you, so there's some dramatic, um, the picture reveals some things that, that the equations don't. So it, in some places, it's just this jumble, right? But, but your eye naturally is drawn probably like to this little strip in here, like right there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. there's, some, there's busyness, something's going on. And then there's this all the space and uh, similar sort of thing happens here, although not quite dr as dramatically. 
and oh, the colors. And <laughs> okay, so but there's no turning back now. <laughs> you are going to be dismayed to learn that the, that the key to unlocking these things is trigonometry. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason you should be dismayed is that up till now there has been absolutely no hint of trigonometry anywhere in sight. What could possibly, like, what could cosine possibly add to the discussion is where you should be right now. Uh, and if you're, well, you, you will have one of two responses to this. You'll either think this, <laughs> or you'll roll up your sleeves and that's what we're gonna do. So cosine is a, well, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a function. You, you plug in an angle and out comes a number. Uh, and we'll take a look at how that process actually works. But you may recall that with cosine, if you plug in an angle that's right down at zero degrees here, then the output, it starts off at one. And then as you start cranking up the size of the angle up to 90 degrees, the output ta tapers off to zero and then it keeps going all the way to negative one, but it, but it cycles. It comes back up to one again by the time you get to 360 and it repeats it all over again. And I'm gonna work with degrees for tonight, just because I'm in a, um, the spirit of, of being, um, of, of using, using a unit that's, that's familiar to everyone, is probably best understood via this picture instead. This is the unit circle. And it's important to, to see this version of cosine because this is what's gonna help tie the trigonometry to what we've just seen. And the idea is this, we'll, we'll call the, the easternmost point on the unit circle the, the zero degree mark. And then we start to crank up the angle and, we, and then we'll move around up to 90 degrees up here and then on over to 180. And we're gonna keep track of the X coordinate as we move around. Sure enough, the X coordinate starts off at, at one. We're one unit to the right. By the time we got up to 90, we're sort of neither right nor left. And by the time we got to 180, we're all the way at the very left. And the, one, and the angle I want you to remember is the 120 degree mark. First of all, will cosine be positive or negative there? Negative. Negative. We've gone past the, uh, the zero mark and we're, we're over here in negative x coordinate land. And 120 actually works out kind of neatly and it's marked up there. The exact cosine is neg negative one half. So remember that number. That's that along with the fact that cosine of zero is one, the cosine starts off of one. That's all you'll need to know. More or less. <laughs> Never believe a teacher when they say that's all you need to know. Okay, so uh, there's our special values. And here, now we're going to jump like to the next chapter or two in the book, <laughs> and we're going to see a double angle formula, um, which will demystify for you. Don't worry. The idea is if you have an angle and you know what its cosine is, it's possible to predict what the cosine of double the angle will be. And we'll try that in a minute, as soon as we see a few even less well-known facts. Because you can do this for tripling angles and quadrupling angles as well. It's, it's just that high school students typically see this one, and maybe if you do like the bonus problem, you see that one, no one ever sees that. <laughs> quadrupling angles are like, no. <laughs> Don't need to go there. Tonight, uh, tonight. <laughs> so let's try these out. Uh, we know we know what happens when we have a 120 degree angle. The coast, oh well, if you double it, not too bad. So shout it out. There's 240. Now, what's the cosine of 240? So we're going to go back a few slides. Remember, 240, 120 would be a third of the way around. So 240 would be another third of the way around. It'd be like going, a th in fact, if you think of it as going a third of the way around in the other direction to get to the two-thirds mark. Mm -hmm. And how do the cosines compare? Same. It'd be the same. You've, whether you go around this way or that way, you've moved to the left the same amount. Cosine of 240 is also negative a half. Okay, so armed with that knowledge, in comes, we skip forward, we double the angle and then take the cosine, out comes negative a half again. So let's see how that compares to what the formula tells us and see if we believe, um, believe this guy. 
So the formula says if you want to know what cosine of nozzle to angle is, you square the cosine value. So we're going to need to square this. But we can do that. Uh, that's just a 4. And then we get 2 times a fourth minus 1. It's all coming, so it's all coming together. Out comes a half minus 1. It's a negative a half. The formula agreed with what it gave us the number we that we were supposed to get. Uh, we might have got lucky again. We would have to try other numbers to be sure. But, uh, but on to the triple angle formula. Does it work? That's the question we're asking. Never mind where it came from. Does it work? So let's try this little exercise again. Suppose you have a 120 degree angle and you triple it. Now you've got 360. If you go all the way around to the 360 mark, what x coordinate do you have there? One, because you're, you're one unit to the left. And the sign would be zero, of course. Uh, but if all goes well, that ridiculous formula should spit out one. If we get one at the end of the day, we cheer. So we have to, well, remember, cosine of 120, that was negative a half. So in goes negative a half for our cosine. We have to cube negative a half. We got it? What's that? Negative, negative, one, negative eight. one eighth. And then that, of course, turns into plus three halves. We cancel the negatives. Is it going to happen? happen? Yeah. My, yeah. No, minus four eighths. That's minus a half plus one and a half. Bingo, one. It worked. Hurrah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the double and triple angle formulas. Now, why did I pull those out? Well, if you've been, if you've been an alert reader so far, <laughs> you may have noticed something suspiciously similar to these multi-angle formulas and those neutron graph formulas we saw earlier. In fact, replacing cosine theta by x is not such a stretch because Cosine is an x value. So let's just put an x there, and, and there they are. Out come the neutron graphs. And so you're, this is the key. So let's see why. Let's go back to our, that, remember that degree 7 polygon, that great 64x to the 7th minus 112x to the 5th? We're going to explain now why all the action for that polynomial got um, fit inside the unit window, armed with this conjecture that the degree three neutron graph matched the like the cosine tripling formula, and the degree four polynomial matched the cosine quadrupling angle. We're well, we're going to try this with seven. So I'll, let's let's take it real. This is where we'll go one baby step at a time. And then we'll sail through the rest of the unit. <laughs> if in the unit window, x is going to run from 1 all the way to negative 1. Those are the x values we're interested in. We want to know what kind of outputs. We, we want to show that all the outputs stay real close to home, that they, they don't go above 1 or below negative 1. So if we want to go from 1 down to negative 1 with x, what kind of angles do we need to use to get all of those outputs to swing all the way from 1 to negative 1? And the answer is 0 to 180. So we're going to think about what happens if cosines would go from 0 to 180. The theorem, that fancy little thing we had on the previous slide, the theorem says, if, if it's true, <laughs> if it's true, the theorem says that when you use cosine in that that polynomial you, you built earlier, mm -hmm. that out should come cosine of 7 theta, that that should be the angle, what was it, septupling formula. Now let's think, what does this do as theta goes from 0 to 180? Well, 7 times 180 is, a, is way over here. So let's think about the outputs we get. The outputs will start at 1, and then they'll drop to negative 1, these are the outputs, the y values on my graph. And then go back up to 1, and then go back down to negative 1, and up to 1, and down to negative 1, and up to 1, and then finally down to 
negative 1 when we get to 7 times 180. So right here is 1 times 180, 2 180s, 3 180s, 4 180s, 5, 6, 7. But all the outputs, you'll notice because of the way cosine works, all the outputs have to stay between negative 1 and 1. They just oscillate back and forth, just like we saw. So that is, is kind of, the, that's what's going on behind the scenes. That, that those formulas we found, in fact, they're, they're not just closely related to, to the cosine, they're, they're really, they're completely explained by mm -hmm. knowing how cosine behaves. Mm -hmm. uh, so as long as that theorem is true, as long as this really is the case, that that formula you gave me, if that really is the angle quin coupling formula, then everything else follows. It hinges on the veracity of the theorem. And I'll leave it as a kind of an interesting exercise to think about what would happen if you plugged in negative a half? What would happen if you use 120 for theta? And why does that explain that that spot in the graph where all of the, the mm -hmm. um, colored, you know, all the colored curves cross at the same spot. So we've got the tools now to explain that. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave that to you. Okay. Instead, um, so that that's it. so you can explain this using that, um, using these ideas. But we're going to go to. You know that we're almost at the end of the talk because no speaker would ever try to prove something. You know, five minutes in. So this is it. And the whole proof is going to happen right here. <laughs> you probably <clears throat> are wondering how that's going to happen. And I'll show you. So let's see. Let's assume that we believe that our second degree polynomial really does match the cosine angle doubling. And the same for tripling. Four. I asked Kevin for dinner, and he said, yes, absolutely. True beyond a shadow of a doubt. So, and we all believe Kevin. <laughs> so, can we somehow use that to convince ourselves that the degree five does what we say it should? Okay, so there's our degree five. If we were to put cosine in, would it really give us cosine of five theta? That's how you'll know when the proof is done. If you see cosine of five theta, we got it. If we put cosine into that, we want to see cosine of 5 theta. Well, think for a minute about where this polynomial came from. Remember how you build it from the previous ones? You build it by taking 2x times the degree 4 one, and then you subtract the degree 3 one. That was, that was our little method for building these. So we know where the degree 5 polynomial came from. Now, if we throw cosine into there, we make a mess. But because Kevin told us, we know that when you throw cosine into the degree 4 one, mm -hmm. we get cosine of 4 theta. Mm -hmm. That's already been established. And we know when we do the degree 3 polynomial and we put cosine in there, we get cosine of 3 theta. That's also been established. So it'll all boil down to here. This becomes a cosine of 3 theta. That becomes a cosine of 4 theta. Mm -hmm. Still don't see a cosine of 5 theta. But at least it's not a mess anymore, so we're probably making some progress. <laughs> Does anyone know what we should do now with this? Here's something that's all the way at the end of the trig chapter. <laughs> we regularly skipped it in my high school. <laughs> you can do something when you have a product of cosines. Turns out there's a a little, like a little footnote to your trig chapter that, that's called product to sum formula. Mm -hmm. And I won't tell you about it. You can look them up if you'd like. Needless to say, the, the question of students throughout time has been, are these things ever actually used for anything other than homework exercises? <laughs> and the answer up to now has been no. But tonight, <laughs> we will employ because we desperately need it, a product to some formula. Cosine of theta times cosine of four theta is precisely the same as cosine of five theta plus cosine of three theta. It's a, it's a fact, it's, it's a product to some formula. And of course now it, we're done because we get cosine of five theta. And, uh, and, we, used, and we used a tool that, that's, that's been
been around for a long time. It's just it's like the laser. It's been waiting for a good use. So that's. <laughs>